notre expédition. Notre expédition à travers le monde nous a fait découvrir et apprécier l'extraordinaire biodiversité de notre planète. De toutes les espèces rencontrées durant nos travaux, il y a une qui nous a particulièrement impressionné, un animal qui ressemble à une sirène et qui a été la source de nombreuses légendes au cours du temps, une créature qui continue à fasciner la humanité. Cette créature est l'humanité. 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 And he has worked with veterinarian Bob Bundy for decades. It's going to be a good day to go out and catch some manatees today. It's a lot of preparation, takes a lot of people. It's made in China. And uh, we're ready to do it. We have a lot of experience catching manatees, so a very experienced team. It's not very risky. The weather's perfect, and we're almost set to go. Uh, let's take the poles and move them up to the... Let's actually take the poles and move them to the other boat. Uh, this is Southern Lagoon, lots of manatees here. Um, what we'll do is we'll take the boat. There's a small channel that winds up to this smaller lagoon, and it's called Quasi Trap, which is an excellent place to catch. It's usually very calm in there, shallow enough, hard bottom, and there's some holes there that manatees go into in a food that they prefer called holodouli. And so we're going to start there. It's a good place to start. It's very safe. It's an easy catch if we find some there. It's a good place to start for us. Great. Okay. Basically, we're on patrol. Um, all the eyes on the water help us to see the manatee. Uh, when the sun's out and it's nice and clear, uh, we can use our polarized glasses and we can see disturbances in the water.
trouver la mentalité. To find a manatee in the turbid waters of the lagoon is a real challenge. You're forced to rely on ripples in the surface of the water to try to figure out where the animal might be. Or you look for some kind of mud cloud in the water, a mud cloud created by the movement of their tail fins. And if you're lucky, you'll see a small part of its head when it surfaces to breathe. So it takes a lot of experience, sharp vision, and I must say, a bit of luck. When the team spots a manatee, Buddy quickly begins to circle the animal with his specially designed boat. The net is quickly deployed, and everyone involved, biologists, veterinarians, and local residents, prepare to dive into the lagoon to secure the net. Everyone jumps in the water around the edge of the net um, to stabilize the net to make sure it doesn't drift. Um, and then once we get all the boat situated and the net situated, we put more people in the water with a small net that we just, just go in and sort of scoop them out uh, with that small net in principle to bring them into our capture net, which is where we do all the um, medical work. This is such a great spot, not only because it's a good place for manatees, but the bottom and the conditions are just perfect for these types of captures, which is what has allowed us to do such a long-term study like this. How many places can you go and find yourself next to an animal that weighs 1,000 pounds, kneel down and pat it on the back without getting trampled to death or bitten or speared or whatever? Um, I love manatees. I didn't learn anything that discouraged me not to. In fact, every day I get up, we learn something new. They're a marine mammal. They're very aquatically adapted. Uh, so they're quite different than most other mammals, so different that they're in their own order, the order of Sirenia. Now, they're more closely related to elephants. If you look at them, the, you know, the teats are underneath the front flippers here. The nails are similar. The skin is a little bit similar. And But rather than having a trunk like an elephant that they can use to pick up a peanut and bring it up to their mouth, manatees have this very prehensile muzzle, and it's used to grab vegetation, cull it up out of the bottom, and bring it into their body. Manatees have his hairs on the body, and we see the vibrissae on the front of their face, which are like a whisker on a dog or a cat. But these are also whiskers on the body, and they act like a lateral line. So this manatee doesn't need his eyes to see you in the water. They're using the sensory organ on their body that enables them to, uh, to basically visualize what's going on around them. They lost their hind limbs. Of course, they don't need them to propel through the water. They use these for steerage, their front flippers, and the tail is a spatula that helps them kind of push and propel themselves through the water effortlessly. From afar, the strange silhouette of a manatee may explain why sailors once associated this marine creature with the mermaids of their imaginations. Once the manatee is caught and brought on board the research vessel, biologists and veterinarians set about their tasks. And they are truly impressive. They have a very well-established work protocol. It's almost as if we were in a hospital and a dozen doctors gathered round to produce a complete health diagnosis. Just go right here, and you have to kind of feel the gum. There we go. We just placed a temperature probe between her gum and her last molar, just so we can get a, a, a sense of her body temperature, her oral temperature. So if it rises too much, we'll know to keep her cool. Okay. Mm -hmm. So if she needs to breathe, just over yep. the nostrils. Mm -hmm. Eleven sixteen. Austin or 1115.
We're measuring the subcutaneous fat layers, and uh, that will give us some information about a nutritional condition. It doesn't tell us the condition of the fat per se, but it gives yeah. us a, the thickness of the fat. Sticking. A sort of microchip is implanted under the skin of the animal to facilitate identification. With the aid of this chip, the scientists can then identify each animal by its unique number. So, if a manatee is recaptured, the medical team will be able to monitor their patient over a period of time. It really is medical care applied to animals. Belize certainly has been very proactive in terms of trying to establish protected for areas for manatees. By protecting manatees, you're also protecting habitat and very important productive habitat like estu you know, coastal estuaries and lagoons. So manatees are known as a, as a flagship species that helps us be able to protect these types of habitats that might be um, threatened. Before the animal is released, it must be weighed a delicate operation that requires special care, since the normally docile manatee can sometimes react violently. Buddy Powell has been fascinated by manatees since childhood. This Floridian encountered these strange marine creatures at an early age. They lived in the waters surrounding his hometown. The manatees of Florida are probably the best known of their species on the planet. They have become particularly well known as victims of collisions with boats. One day, someone was fascinated enough to make a film about the manatees. That person was Jacques Cousteau, and Buddy Powell's destiny changed completely after he met the captain of the Calypso. When I was 14 years old, the fellow named Daniel Hartman was working on his PhD from Cornell University, and he came to my hometown, um, Crystal River, which is now very famous for manatees. So he was out on the water, and it was obvious he was out of place. And so I was kind of curious, because I was on the water all the time, and finally went up to him, and we started talking. And uh, we ended up becoming friends. He sort of took me on as his field assistant, and I worked with him for uh, a couple years while he was doing his PhD work. And then a number of years later, he had written an article for National Geographic, and the Cousteaus uh, saw this article and wanted to do the first documentary on manatees. And so he told them, get a hold of this kid in Crystal River, which they did. And uh, so I ended up being their guide for um, over a year uh, when they were doing this uh, first documentary. And that's really what began the momentum for all the conservation work and protected areas and measures that we have for manatees today. Manatees are very docile creatures, and they're docile because they're very intelligent. Um, and we use an adage, an elephant never forgets. Well, manatees have to remember. They have to have rote memorization that allows them to go back to a place and find it later. And the training starts when they're very young. The mother trains the baby, and then the baby picks up on that and, and emulates that. They don't produce a lot of babies, but one baby every two, three, four, five years. So they invest a lot into making sure that baby has all of the tools it needs to meet the challenges in the environment. If it doesn't if it fall short, the animal will die. So these animals, to be long-lived, have to invest a lot of effort into the, into the, the rearing of the young. Pull, man! 
Okay, let's pull that net that way, bring him over slowly. This time it's not one, but two manatees in the research boat. The small vessel is getting a bit crowded, but the biologists and veterinarians have a well-established routine, and it is amazing how efficiently their work is accomplished, particularly impressive when one realizes that their research will serve the scientific community of the entire world. Manatees are great. Um, I think that I am passionate about because it's something unique to my country. <laughs> Okay, hey guys, we need to roller a little bit. With Buddy Powell and Bob Bundy and the whole team, it's, it's been wonderful. It's, it, we've built up this data set like no other for manatees, especially the Antillean subspecies. Um, we're getting information that we can apply for management decisions in this country, and we've been able to take advantage of what they have learned, and we can implement it, so that's a great advantage for us. We're going to take a, a tissue biopsy that we use for genetics um, to tell us uh, the, the, the fingerprint of this manatee, basically. And to get that sample, we just use some Novocaine. Um, we apply it with a needle into the skin here. This is the same medicine that uh, numbs the skin that the dentist would use to extract a tooth or to do dental work, and we use it on the manatee uh, so that it's less painful when we take the biopsy sample. We use it for uh, several things, stable isotopes to look at the food the manatee's been feeding on um, and what his chemical makeup is, and then we'll use it for uh, genetics in pedigree studies and fingerprinting studies of individuals. We've actually done quite a few studies that have been published on these Belizean manatees to tell us a little bit more about evolution of manatees in general. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it's pretty special this morning. Two females, one of whom may be pregnant. And it's really amazing to see how well all the veterinarians and biologists have been trained. They can do a whole series of procedures in about 50 minutes. It's really a well-oiled machine. And it's extraordinary to see how quiet and calm the animals are. Are we ready? We do call this a cookie, um, and we do that because it, it resembles an Oreo. Yeah. Dark on the outside, white on the inside. It's not meant to eat, but it gives us the food for knowledge. And we learn through studying this little piece of tissue, it gives us some information about this manatee, which helps us to understand about manatees literally in general. And right now, how, how's the population status here? Yeah, well, actually, it's pretty good. You know, they don't have a lot of allelic diversity, so there isn't a lot of variation. A lot of the individuals are similar alike, but maybe they're similar alike for certain re reasons, that they've perfected this habitat, this environment, and that their best, uh, their DNA is best used and utilized to, uh, to achieve that. Things got a bit out of hand during the weighing. Our two manatees became a bit edgy and knocked overboard everything that was nearby, including the huge structure that was used to weigh them, along with some biologists, veterinarians, and even members of the film crew. Really an impressive display of strength. With their caudal fins, they can break your bones in a flash. There are occasions when it's best just to abandon ship. What is surprising is to see how these remarkably calm animals can become so aggravated. They're able to lift their tails approximately one or one and a half meters. This is extraordinary, so it's best not to be too close at such moments.
The amenities weigh 1,000 pounds. Because it's so quiet and four or five people are around, everything looks okay. But as soon as it starts moving, it's not long before everyone's overboard. Yeah. Amanda, do we have a temperature? A lot of students come from abroad um, to gather data, to collect and, and do analysis in the U.S. in particular, but it's an opportunity for Belizean students as well. And what I'd like to see is more Belizeans getting involved, more Belizeans on the ground, collecting the data and using it for advanced degrees. But we haven't been able to capitalize quite as much on that as we'd like to. So that is something that I'd definitely like to push for the future. When we first started the study, or early on, Jamal would show up at our dock um, at the morning, sort of looking at us. He was about 11 years old, and he kept wanting to get on the boat, but he was too young. We found out later that um, Jamal, with some of his friends in the village there, that they, instead of playing cowboys and Indians, they'd play Buddy and Bob and take turns on who would get to drive the boat and who would catch the manatees. And so they would pretend that they were circling the manatees and um, uh, later on, you know, he was just so enthusiastic, we invited him to come on board as a volunteer. And then just one, one thing led to another. He was always part of our crew, and he continued um, uh, every year. And I think it, it enabled him to sort of see that there was more out there besides just what was in his village. And so he's continued on through his high school and now gotten his AA degree from the university. And he adores manatees and science and research and learning. This conservation field, I think, is something that I was born to do. And it's not necessarily a job to me, but it's a, it's my playing field. It's where I like being. It's my, it's where I'm in my glory, and it means more than anything to me. Cause this is where my passion is. This is where my heart is. As a scientist, it's extremely important to write scientific papers and publish. But what's really fulfilling, but also extremely important, is the people you leave there and leave behind, and what you can contribute. Just like. Daniel Hartman, again, did for me when I was 14 years old. Jamal, a child of the village, grew up and today is living his dream. Acknowledged internationally for his work as a biologist and manatee researcher. Just as Jacques Cousteau once did for a boy in Florida, Buddy Powell. Dreams come true and careers are forged out of passion and determination. Despite conservation efforts in Belize, despite campaigns to try to reduce the speed of vessels, collisions are inevitable since these manatees are slow animals and they use the same areas as the boats. And collisions with boats may have truly catastrophic consequences for manatees. This young manatee lost its mother when she was hit by a boat. In poor health, the orphan was rescued by Jamal a young local biologist. Fortunately, today it is doing better, thanks to the care of a manatee rehabilitation center, Wild Tracks. Wild Tracks is a non-profit organization, and under that we have a number of programs, including the manatee rehabilitation program that cares for injured and orphaned manatee calves um, throughout the country are brought in here when they need care. So our role with that is to raise them up given the skills to be able to then survive once they're released back into the wild. When did you start Wild Tracks? The actual overall programs we started in 1990. Back in 1999, uh, we started the Manti Rehabilitation Program as one program under the organization as a whole. And how many manatees did you have since? So far, 10. Um, thankfully not huge numbers, which would be a really bad indication of the status of the wild population, the pressures, but yeah, it's normally one or two manatees here in care at any one time. And how long are they staying in average? Um, about two to two and a half years. 
So here we're going to have the crew forming a line. We're going to move him through the gate and catch him on the other side here. So it takes enough people to have um, going up here, one to make sure he's not in a corner, move him through the gateway, and then we'll guide him into this corner for actually lifting him out. And this guy came in very emaciated um, in February of this year. His condition was critical, so we had to get food in. So he's been nasogastric tube fed, so a tube feeding tube up the nostril down into the stomach and uh, stayed on with that. Mm. So it's rather invasive, but it ha is what saved his life. You know, without that, there's just no way we would have kept him alive. The residents live in a natural basin within the lagoon that has been fenced off. Because they do not suffer the stress of an artificial environment, it is easier to reintroduce them into the wild. A little bit high, keep his tail off. Let's take him head in and then turn him round. Do the um, the feed net, and maybe if you do the water. Okay. So uh, we wait for that breath. Insert the tube whilst the nostrils open. You see the valves closed, and then we uh, push the tube in slowly and carefully, trying to ease it to make sure it goes down the esophagus into the stomach. We have the tube measured against the back end of his flipper to make sure that we're reaching into his stomach about here. Um, when he came in, that we were feeding him twice a day. Now we've cut it down to once a day, even once every second day, because we're trying to encourage him to eat more of the seagrass himself, because this is obviously a pretty invasive system, but when you've got a very emaciated animal, emaciated animal, you have to get food in as fast as you can and get the condition up. He's still probably 80 to 100 pounds underweight as compared to what he should be at this age. They'll lose weight really fast, but it takes quite a long time to put it on. And this is one way of getting the food into him. He's he came in at just under a year old, just pre-weaning, minimum weaning age, which is a very difficult age to get them onto a bottle. So he refused to take a bottle. His condition was so poor, we had to get nutrient into him immediately. The only option we had was to start him on nasogastric tube feeding. We can make up a very high energy, high protein milk mix such as this. And we know he's getting everything apart from the dribbles I'm spilling out here. I suppose that, you know, every uh, survival animal are very important because the population is pretty low around here. Indeed. Um, as an endangered subspecies, you know, it's critical to get as many back into the wild population as possible. Um, Estimates vary for the Belize population anywhere from 500 to a maximum of 1,000 animals. Um, even if it's 1,000, that's not a very big population, and that's the biggest population of this species in its range. So getting each individual back into the breeding population is clearly a very important uh, task. So she would be happy to go back uh, in a while. Indeed, yeah. indeed. Yeah, it's always uh, straight down and take that breath of air and <sighs> done for today. OK, well, let's uh, move him in. OK, ready? 
and down. So he'll probably go down and come up about halfway along the pool for a fresh breath of air, I suspect. Another resident was waiting at the door of the enclosure. In fact, every day when the darkness sets in, Twiggy, a former resident of the center, returns to spend a night safely inside the enclosure. Uh, so now Twig is fitted with a radio transmitter that floats up. It makes it a lot easier finding out where she... In fact, there she is, just over there. You can see her just coming in. So we'll have one of the girls open up, let her in, then someone else can feed her down here. And this one is an, an old friend of you. Yep, she's been here for three years now. She's accustomed to us and vice versa. And actually, the last bit of rehabilitation is standing back, so they're learning to step back from people. And the first six months after release, it's also, OK, no one anywhere near, because obviously, as a wild animal, she's got to keep away from people rather than coming in the way she's still accustomed to coming in for feed. She's been on um, learning um, to live out loose for um, about 18 months now, so one of our assistants from the village um, started taking her out loose, supervised, taught her how to eat seagrass. He'd actually pick seagrass and eat it himself to show her. Um, gradually, we'd step back, so instead of being with her, we'd leave her alone for an hour or two hours. Until now, she's let out about 6 o'clock in the morning. She'll go out all day grazing seagrass, and then about 4.30 in the afternoon, she's coming back in to have a little banana shake and stay in her sleeping area for the night. So, yeah, it's, it's quite a good routine she's got, and we're just gradually extending, taking her further out, letting her explore further out, and she has a transmitter so we know where she is, until eventually she'll be going out through the creeks out to the bay itself. Buddy, Bob, and their team have left Gales Point for the busy waters of Belize City. Here, maritime traffic represents a real threat to the manatee population. Hunting is what has caused the population of manatees in Belize and generally the Americas to be at a threatened level. Sailors, pirates that would use the waters in Belize used to hunt the manatees and there is evidence um, around these keys as well uh, where Moho Key which is not too far off Belize City was a hunting site um, probably the Mayas also hunted them. Now the hunting has been replaced by them being killed by boats and so I feel like more than you, you can study an animal and watch its decline, but it, and at this point, the information that we gather and what we do is, is aimed at trying to reduce those threats. All right, guys, let me assign boats. Okay. One of you go on the capture boat, you decide. And then the other person can go on the fisheries boat. You're on the capture boat. Trenton, you're swimming. Um, you guys stay where you are. Maureen, you're on the fisheries boat. about 20 to 25 percent of deaths that will be positively identified as being from a watercraft and we can identify that either from external injuries where the propeller will severely scar the animal where it would um, open up the animal or we would open the animal during a necropsy and when we open it it looks fine from the outside but when we open it we might find uh, a broken rib that has maybe punctured the lung and the only thing that would cause that would be a boat. If we were in Florida, this entire coastline would just be condominiums and houses and boats going this way and that way that the manatees would have to contend with. You would never see an animal without one boat strike. 
One of the reasons we're doing this study in this particular place is that there are boats going into the Belize River. So we were trying to find out through our radio tracking, you know, how often they are moving over towards the river to be in harm's way. And so uh, with that information, then the government of Belize can act by putting up speed zones uh, where it's necessary, where there's the most chance of boat and manatee conflicts. So they can make sure that at least in those areas, boats are going slowly enough so that not only do they not disturb manatees, but they don't hit them. There's no Sharpie. No Sharpie in there? This time, the team hopes to install a satellite transmitter on a manatee to better identify which areas the species uses and eventually to regulate maritime traffic. In the future, if they're not already, these animals are having problems with interactions with humans and boats and those kinds of things. We don't see evidence of a lot of scars like we do in Florida, but eventually we will. Once it's scarred, it's either scarred for life or it's dead. And when we see these scars, they came close to dying, but they survived and persisted. But they're going to carry that scar the rest of their life. Number three now. Tourism certainly is a wonderful thing for Belize. It's one of our biggest income earners for the country. Um, but we try to make sure that we are informing tour guides in particular where are the hot spots where manatees are that they should be careful when they travel for instance the Belize River um, that is a very beautiful location in Belize it is used very heavily by tour boats and it's also used very heavily by manatees <laughs> together inserting the batteries uh, for the satellite transmitter. This is what we will uh, deploy in just a few minutes. It's all full of air so it floats like a buoy. It has two transmitters. One transmitter um, transmits up to um, several satellites and it has another transmitter that allows us to be able to follow it on the ground, on the water. How long will it last? Um, it'll last about a year. Um, the satellite part, it actually has a uh, salt switch um, so that when it submerges under the water, it shuts it off. And then when it comes up to the surface again, it starts transmitting again, and that helps us save batteries. Once a year. Protecting their habitat is the only real hope we have of saving the last survivors of this endangered species. Despite these conservation efforts in Belize, there are only between 500 and 1,000 manatees left, a very small number. Research must continue. The use of satellite transmitters will allow a better understanding of manatees' territories and come up with measures to protect habitats essential to their survival. One of the things we're trying to find out are where the most important areas are that they go. Um, and we do this so that when we're trying to establish protected areas, it's fine to protect one area here, but if the animal spends 50% of its time someplace else, you want to make sure that both areas are protected, So, and also the corridors in between. So this allows us to be able to find out what its critical habitat is and the corridors that they use to move in between. A number of them that we have tagged um, and with a collaborator in Mexico have come down from Mexico to Belize, to Southern Lagoon, for example, which we think might be an important nursery area. So this is the um, tether I was talking about. It, it won't knot. It's semi-flexible, and this, this prevents it from getting caught on and knotted up in mangrove. It's got a... Um, the belt has a weak link in it, and there's also a weak link inside here, so that if it does get caught on something, it will snap free. Okay. 
We're just, wanna, we're just making sure that the tag works, so when you, when you release the animal, um, you don't come out here and not be not able to find the tag because the frequency doesn't match the tag before we put it out, because once it's out there, it's gone, man. Yeah? One, two, three. One, two, three. Three. One, two, three. We can figure out the areas that they spend most of their times and that will give us an idea to better um, manage the area that they hang out and protect them better. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Some people have asked that question, you know, why is it important to protect manatees? These animals are resilient, they're tough, and with protection and with a buy-in from the community and the people, we will have manatees around for future generations to enjoy. I'm going to do Buddy and Bob's team have captured over 20 manatees in under two weeks. This population is a model for research around the world, and this fantastic work will help us learn more about it. Manatees are excellent indicators of ocean health, especially in coastal regions. But they face the same threats everywhere. Habitat degradation, pollution, and obviously, collisions with boats. Fortunately, there are scientists who dedicate their lives to protecting threatened species like the manatee. And the next generation is taking up the torch. Young people like Jamal, or Buddy before him, are passionate about the environment and protecting biodiversity. Dreams and passions often inspire great stories. When young people decide to save a threatened species when they grow up, it inspires hope. Dreams like these can be contagious and inspire others. That's what happened to Buddy years ago, who was inspired by Jacques Cousteau. And now Jamal, from the village of Gales Point, is taking inspiration from new mentors like Buddy and Bob.